Hey booktube and welcome back to History Considered. My name is Alex and today I'm going to be doing a review of Nicholas Jellicoe's book Jutland, The Unfinished Battle. But before I jump into that, I just want to say a big thank you to the people that subscribed and commented and liked my first video, my intro newbie tag video. And you guys made me feel very welcome and now I feel like I'm not just talking to myself. So thank you for that. I went from zero subscribers up to seven and I do really appreciate it. So this book, Jutland, The Unfinished Battle, is about the battle that took place 100 years ago before, before the book was published. The book was published in 2016, in May 2016. And I received a publisher's copy. This is the first time ever that I've received a publisher's copy of a book for review. And I <clears throat> started reading it last year, but I've been putting it off. I was going to do a review on my podcast or on my blog, but I've been putting it off. I haven't been reading a lot. So I've been reading other things. Just put that book down. So I decided that since I'm getting back into booktube, this would be a good opportunity for me to start off with this book that um, I got for review. And the work is written by Nicholas Jellico, who is the grandson of one of the main actors that um, was involved in the Battle of Jutland in May 1916. That was Admiral John Jellico. So the author of this book is the grandson of Admiral John Jellico, which created an interesting spin on reading this book. You were kind of naturally looking for ways in which the author may be biased or, or he's trying to be even-handed or whether he's trying to protect the reputation of his grandfather, which is very natural, I mean, and kind of... Um, you would you would expect it but i generally found that he was very fair the author i'm not an expert in jutland this is the first dedicated book to the subject that i've read and i thought that for the most part he criticized uh jellico his grandfather john jellico when uh he thought it was appropriate and he did defend him at other times so it seemed pretty even-handed to me the first part of the book talks about the context of the Battle of Jutland, which again took place in May 1916. It talks about the buildup of the British and the German navies, the people involved in that buildup. Then it, it groups its chapters in that section based on two individuals per chapter. So the first, the first one would, the first section talked about the two builders of the navies, the respective builders for the British and German navies, the main chief planners and strategists behind that, that's Tirpitz for the German navy, and um, what was his name? Fisher for the British navy. And then the other sections talk about the actual participants in the Battle of Jutland. Uh, for the British, it was John Jellico and David Beatty. Those are the two highest um, admirals at sea. And for the Germans, it was Scheer and Hipper. And for the rest of the book, the main focus kind of turns to J uh, John Jellico and David Beatty. So I'll talk about those uh, individuals. Those were the British admirals in charge during the Battle of Jutland. The author does make use of German sources. He says it's, like, it's important to look at those sources, but I didn't, I didn't get the sense that there was uh, an equal balance between perspectives. It was, it was mostly looking at uh, the controversy surrounding John Jellico and David Beatty. Um, they were two very different individuals. John Jellico was in command of the Grand Fleet of the British, which is the main section of the fleet with all the battleships and all the dreadnoughts. And David Beatty was in command of the battlecruiser component, which was kind of like the scouting force. It still had very heavy ships, but it played a very significant part in the beginning of the Battle of Jutland when the 
battlecruiser forces of the British and the battlecruiser forces of the Germans they met and both each one was trying to entice the other into coming into a trap so that it, it was trying to entice the battlecruisers to come in where the main fleet would destroy them so who was successful in doing that um, in springing that trap it was the British uh, that were successful the German battlecruisers um, the German battlecruisers and fleet sailed towards the grand fleet of the British and the British had a very good opportunity to possibly destroy the German fleet in what was called the crossing the T maneuver. It was a maneuver where you, um, the ships at the top of the T that were, that were formed uh, in such a way would be able to deliver maximum firepower on, on a concentrated section of the opponent's fleet and destroy it piece by piece by piece. So a lot of the controversies of the battle surround why John Jellicoe, who commanded that part of the T, was not able to destroy the German fleet once David Beatty had supposedly delivered the German fleet to him in a, on a platter, essentially. And there are different schools of thought as to who was correct because the visibility was extremely bad for for both sides during the battle um, it was getting really dark as and added to that the smoke from the guns going off was really creating poor visibility conditions and David Beatty can be faulted in that he did not communicate the position of the German fleet uh, when he was spotting them because he was kind of like the eyes and ears of the British Grand Fleet. And he didn't communicate that information to John Jellicoe. He um, did not communicate other essential pieces of information to John Jellicoe, like the sinking of a couple uh, battle cruisers and his force. So there's controversy surrounding that. On the other hand, John Jellicoe, Admiral John Jellicoe was blamed for his lack of initiative in following up and chasing the German high seas fleet after they were brought to him by David Beatty. So the author Nicholas Jellicoe says at one point that the battle shouldn't have been as controversial as it was because the main objective of the British was achieved. They didn't necessarily want to destroy the German high seas fleets during the war. They just wanted to retain command of the seas, which they, um, have, which they had for about a hundred years prior. I'll talk about that. I'll talk on that point a little bit later. So essentially they, he was saying the battle shouldn't have been as controversial because the main objective to retain control of the seas was achieved by the British. The German high seas fleet never, try to sail forth again in a way to meet the British fleet in a big encounter anymore. Uh, they focus their operations on submarines and, and you know these vessels that didn't have to engage uh, an enormous fleet on equal terms. They can, uh, they can run under the waves and have a more um, uh, guerrilla, style of warfare, so to speak. So that's Nicholas Jellicoe's point. But then he, he says that this battle shouldn't have been as controversial. But then he does proceed throughout the book to talk in great detail about the controversies, uh, probably because his grandfather was involved in them and he feels like he needs to uh, have a, you know, his say on why, you know, what is fair and what is not fair in his opinion in the way that his grandfather was treated. The most interesting aspect of the book that I found, and that was new for me, uh, everything else I kind of already had in my mind about the, the Battle of Jutland, that it was a stalemate, that um, there was a problem with the way that the British handled ammunition, he goes into that a little bit, which caused David Beatty to famously say 
there must be something wrong with our bloody ships today. When two of his ships um, had blown up uh, in this catastrophic way. And um, so I had already watched a few documentaries on YouTube about the Battle of Jutland. Um, so a lot of these things was just going, were just going into more and more detail on the controversies behind the battle, technical aspects of the battle, which ships went where and why, the communication problems that they were having. But the piece that I did find to be really interesting was when the author talked about how the Battle of Trafalgar, the memory of the Battle of Trafalgar, had affected perceptions of the Battle of Jutland. So let me explain. The Battle of Trafalgar was fought in 1805. It was a naval battle between the British and the French and some other countries. And it was a, it was a whopping British victory. Admiral Nelson became a hero after that. The British would control the oceans for the next hundred years, had undisputed control of the, of the oceans. And uh, Admiral Nelson's uh, statue and column are famously in Trafalgar Square in London. Now, this created a perception in the British public, especially, and in the British with the British politicians, and to a certain extent, it seems in the British Navy itself, that in, if any other time the British fleet would encounter an enemy that was, you know, equal or at least in the same class of its size, that the, the British would defeat that enemy in the same kind of dramatic fashion as happened in the Battle of Jutland. Now this, the author says, fueled the controversies after the battle because this dramatic victory for the British did not happen. It did not materialize. And they, the British public expected it. So you have strange things happening like the British after just uh, having fought an extremely tiring and extremely traumatic battle, the ships, some of the ships were limping back to port and the British sailors you know, were wounded, they were tired, um, they had done their best in the battle and they were being jeered and uh, spat upon by the British public that was meeting them at home. Uh, sometimes literally they were being spat upon these sailors because the public had received initial German base reports that the Germans had won that particular engagement which wasn't entirely accurate so this idea of Trafalgar as serving as a uh, a symbol in the mind of the British public I found very interesting and I wish the author developed this point a little bit more throughout the book because he just mentions it in several places but it does play a really significant role. It would have been a really interesting book if he, I think if he made that the focus of the book rather than discussing some of the um, secondary characters like the builders of the Navy early on in the book, um, the way that that was structured, their narr narrative was a little bit hard to follow because he'd skip from one character to the next, sometimes in one paragraph to the next. And while it did provide some context for what was going on in the uh, build-up to the war, I thought that it was difficult to determine who the author was writing the book for. Was he writing it for an absolute beginner to the battle? Because in that case, the, the work is very technical in nature at times especially in the section where he talks about the battle. There's a lot, a lot of detail about who sent which communication, who didn't send a communication, which ship moved where, uh, and why they were doing those maneuvers, what were the admirals thinking to a certain extent. So there goes into a lot of detail, which I think a beginner to, the, to this uh, topic would probably find a little bit boring. I found it a little bit boring. Um, the nitty gritty, but to somebody that wants to, has already knows about the battle and wants to delve into the scholarship behind the controversies, behind behind the ship's movements. Sorry about that. There's uh, some sirens outside. I live in a pretty busy uh, 
street area. But yeah, if, if you wanna if you wanna know about the ship's movements and all that kind of jazz, then I think this would be a good introduction to that. But as it were, I was a fairly novice reader in the subject, and I wanted more about uh, descriptions about the characters, maybe focusing on these ideas that the British had about a second Trafalgar. Um, and uh, John Jellicoe himself even said at one point that if the visibility had been better, there would have been a second Trafalgar. He would have defeated the German fleet. Uh, so I thought that was interesting that he had that perspective. Even he himself was uh, caught up in this complex of n there needing to be a um, major victory at Jutland. So those are my thoughts on the book. Thank you guys for watching. Um, I want to ask you to post in the comments. Uh, it's been a hundred years since a lot of these battles took place, almost ex exactly a hundred years since those the battles of World War One have taken place. There's going to be an anniversary for the Battle of Passchendaele coming up uh, later this year. I'll probably read a book about that battle to commemorate it. Have you read any books about World War I uh, lately that have been published recently uh, commemorating these 100-year anniversaries? And if so, what did you think about them, and do you have any recommendations for me? So thank you guys for watching. I did record, I did record this video once um, before. And it turned out to be 30 minutes long, and I decided to re-record it, so it's a little bit shorter. But it's already running to be almost 17 minutes. So I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, and comment. I do appreciate it since I'm just starting out on my channel. And I am going to do um, some videos coming up. I've got a TBR with some of these books I'm going to be reading. And I uh, have some other ideas for videos as well. So thank you for watching History Considered, and I'll see you guys next time.